So my name is Nicole. I run data strategy professionals and we mostly help people pass the CDMP exam. I'm really excited to see everybody. The agenda for today, we're going to do alternating sessions of silent reading followed by discussion. So in the past, this has been really helpful for people to just dedicate time in the middle of the month. It's probably a good idea to review data architecture at least a little bit because it is 6% of the questions on the CDMP fundamentals exam. So we'll just read silently for the next 16 and a half minutes, and then we'll come together to discuss the reading. Does anybody want to share something that they read in this chapter that was interesting to them? The Jackman framework, all the six, what, how, where, with a different perspective. Do you feel like this is practical and, and useful? Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing we see in Togafa as well. Yeah, I kind of feel like a lot of this is a checklist of lenses from which to look at different aspects of data. You mentioned the Zachman framework. Yeah, let's just have a checklist of like six perspectives, you know, and then do the who, what, when, where, why for all of them. In my scenario, enterprise data architecture is defining all the angles where I'm currently working. So, yeah, I thought it interesting how they start off talking about like, what are the different meanings of data architecture? One thing that I had forgotten about this section is that there's this table, figure 22, where they compare the different domains of architecture. Of course, we are focused on data architecture, but there's other ways that this concept of architecture can be applied in a business where there's business architecture and application architecture, technology architecture, et cetera. I'm sure not every organization thinks about their structure in this table, but it is interesting to see Dama break it out this way and put data architecture as one path within the overall broader category of things that can be architected. I thought it interesting how they talk about like the three, <laughs> supposedly three waves led mm -hmm. by finance and then digital services and then internet of things and informatics. Yeah. I think that's on page 99. So I guess financial institutions were first and quickest. They certainly have a lot of data. It's low hanging fruit, easily available. All Definitely. they need is computation. Uh, I guess like the second wave of digital services, they were probably like not already established, but starting up in response to data. And then the third wave, traditional industries, they already existed, but it wasn't like natural to them necessarily. They sort of integrated it to get a value add. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting. But also um, like later on, a lot of this just offers a checklist of perspectives. Uh, we start with the, oh, we have to do AI. We have to start with the AI straight away. And then we say, okay, cool down. We have to do AI, but you need to do X, Y, Z before that. Exactly. So, so that's where I am. It's very common where people don't know what to do with the data they have other than their normal transactional business and reporting. They want to do a lot, but building blocks to get the right value is something which I'm struggling with to tell senior leadership. Because we need to have our data quality, data governance, security, all the whole wheel of DAMA is kind of... Missing. I second that one, Mandrit. I agree totally what you're saying. It's same thing in this world. People want to know, they want the quality of it, but they don't want to invest money and they don't want to focus or like give priority to the data governance and uh, within the business. There are lack of the, the business steward knowledge, but they want everything. Yeah, I was reading this data quality chapter recently, and I believe if we focus on data quality, data governance is very much connected with that term as well. If we architect a data management in the right way, it will definitely support them maintaining the high quality of data. Definitely. So I think I'm mixing I'm mixing two things here. I will let, you know, we'll discuss chapter 13 whenever it comes, Nicole. Yeah, but, uh... in December. <laughs> As it we're ways. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. That gives us 14 and a half minutes to get some reading done. I'll open it up again for continued discussion. Enterprise data model is a combination of a conceptual model and logical data model. In other words, it is a combination of all three. If you see the page number one of five, there is the way they talk about LDM and PDM as well, which is physical right. data model. So physical data model is where you actually end up doing your normalization and all based on your uh, requirement of the data usage. You might want to keep it denormalized as well in certain places. For example, for your 
reporting, you might prefer to keep it denormalized and can have some sort of duplication of the rules, you know. That makes sense. So that's for the PDM. But the whole EDM as a concept is a combination of all three implementation, conceptual model, logical model, and physical model. That's how I see it. And when I talk about the subject area model, I see the subject area as the business domains. That's how generally it has been done. Then you have a logical model. And that's how the company generally does. If more than one business domain is using a product, they would like to duplicate and then connect to the conceptual model on the top. So yeah, subject area model is actually linked to the business model in other words. That's how it is currently been done. It's all subject area models comes into the picture if the underlying the data is used, the business requirements are complex and they want to separate it out to different within the subdomains like mm. payments and uh, just capturing the claims or the banking details, for example. And also how fat and long your the main table is, that's where a model will be divided into two subject area models to reduce the complexity and considering the, the reporting layer as the ultimate layer for the reporting purpose to completely denormalize. So that's where I see the subject area models comes into the picture between the um, like after logical one. Got it. In my last workplace, we use biz design using UML modeling. The whole thing in one screen, the way they have shown in pay figure 23, it's not doable. Hard. It's a little bit oversimplified. I mean, yes. a lot bit oversimplified. Oversimplified. It's not doable like this. There's a layers of UML modeling. Uh, if I start doing via UML. Let's go back to readings. We have one final reading session and then we will wrap up at the end and say goodbye. Can I ask one question, Nicole? I'm yeah. reading one statement on page number 115. Diagramming clarity. And the last oh, point, yeah. lin linear symmetry. What does it really mean by, you know, should be aligned together? So this is like when you're making a diagram that has a lot of boxes, then mm -hmm. they're saying at least 50% of the boxes should be snapped to some kind of axis, vertical or horizontal. If you just put the boxes willy nilly where they're overlapping each other or they're not aligned to okay. a, a grid. I think this okay, one could have been better called like use a grid as much as possible. <laughs> yeah, it's clear what exactly. So I okay. will show linear symmetry. The checking yeah. line, the line, the box top line should match with another box line. It's not possible. <laughs> right. Yes. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Good question. All right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you being here and have a good night.